All right, three seven. Three seven. Pantote. Mathanta. Kai. Mayday Pote. Ace Epinosin. Alethias. Ailthane. Dina Mina. Pantote, that's a little adverbial. Adverb. That means always, always. Mon Thanonta. Who were the guys always learning and never did get it right? In the New Testament times. Who was the, who were the people that were the, the, the real know-it-alls that never had it right? The Pharisees. Cindy? The Pharisees? Who were the ones that were always learning and never got it right? No. Huh? The Gnostics. The know-it-alls. The Gnostics didn't have it right at all. They didn't get on. You've you got to be on the first step. They jumped way out there and said that Jesus was not God the Son, that he was not deity at all, that he's just a spirit that was never really human or whatever. There are all kinds of levels of Gnosticism. Anyway, they never learned, and they infiltrated the churches. Where did where did Muhammad get his ideas of Jesus? From the Gnostics. That's where he got it from the Gnostics. Always learning. Let's look at that word there. What what is that, Sharon? Can you can you conjugate and uh, learning? <coughs> Okay, it's present. Now, it's it's written in a different way. It's present active participle. Okay, so what does that mean, that present active participle? Something going on all the time in this. All right? And then what places it is in the, the cases? We have to conjugate it and place it in a case also. This is a, a participle, so it is conjugated like a verb and declined like a noun. <coughs> Conjugated and declined both. It's accused of plural and neuter. Always learning. And see how they're doing? Always they are learning. Okay? Always they are learning. Because we have, we have plural here, don't we? Always they are learning. And the learning is what they're focused on. They're Gnostics. You know, they know it all. Always they are learning and never. May pot, may de pote. May de pote. Uh, who knows how to break that one down? Brother Roger, you know how to break that one down? It's from three basic words. May, a particle of ne ne negation. We have day, a weak adversative conjunctive particle, and then we have pote. All right? And this is a little adverb also. May, day, pote. Look right down below that. But may, day, pote. Moreover, not, or never. And then we have the word ace. This word ace here, that's a uh, preposition, isn't it? Page 119, if it's not down on yours, but down on page 119. Now, what is the, uh, uh, the grammatical rule for ace? Uh, Brother Chuck, do you know that one yet? All right, Cindy? Okay, extension or limitation of thought or verbal action. What is the Hebrew equivalent, Jerry? The first and the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It is. It's what you did yeah. to dinner. What? <laughs> edit. Yeah. <laughs> so here we have it. It means action is going that way. Action is going that way. Never, always learning and never, epinosin. And this is a what we call a, uh, a derogatory statement by Paul concerning the agnostic, uh, concerning the Gnostics. They knew it all. They had superior knowledge, but he said they never, never unto the full knowledge. How can you get to God without Jesus Christ being the Savior God of this world? Wouldn't the Gnosticism existed by, 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 uh, during the same time as Paul? It yeah, it was going on. Most of uh, John's writings are, is against Gnosticism. First, second, and third John's, 
uh, and First John really gets with them, Second John and Third John, and then the Gospel according to John. Right in the beginning, in our K ain't whole logos, kai whole logos pro, kai whole logos ain't proston theos, or theon, kai whole logos ain't theos. Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was coming up. It was coming up at this time. These people believed this. And when Jesus came into the world, he totally destroyed their philosophy. And they had this, this is what we call allegorical platonic thinking. That's what was wrong with Augustine in the, in the third and fourth century. We have Augustine with the platonic ideas where he allegorized the scriptures instead of literal interpretation. Always learning and never able to come to complete knowledge. How are you ever going to be in complete knowledge if you're an Islam, where you deny all of Christ? And Mormonism, and Jehovah Witness, all of these cults, these cults that make less of Christ than what he is. The cults will attack the person of God. Write down this. A cult will always attack the person of God. And they will change the person of God into something different than what he is. Even Catholicism changes God and makes him four persons. Four persons. The God of the Bible, Hear, O Israel, our Lord is one. Ahad is one. One God. We don't have three gods. we got one God. And Catholicism believes in God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and Mary the mother of God. And they worship Mary above Jesus. That's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. The complete knowledge. Aletheos. Aletheos. What's this word aletheos mean? Brother Roger, aletheos. What is the feminine name in, in the world today for aletheos? Does anybody know anybody named Althea? I knew. Huh? I knew All right, Althea. That, that her name means truth. But what does this word Althea mean? You remember this, Christine? Brother Roger. No shadow. No shadow. Absolutely no shadows. It's completely in the light from all angles. There is no shadow. There is no shadow. Now, I've been recording at home my classes. I've got God's eternal purpose that I'm doing and then the, uh, the Kingdom Studies, the Kingdom of God series. And I have a lot of trouble getting light on me, don't I? Because we're in a house. If I open the window behind me, there's too much light behind me, and I look like I'm a ghost. And so I got one more light and put up there by me, two lights shining on me and one light shining right behind me, and I finally, I'm there. They can see me now for whatever good that does. But, they, you know, we have it on video. The truth. Unto the truth. No shadows. Elthane. Elthane. It comes from Erechimai, by the way. Elthane is all broken up in its second aorist infinitive active voice. What's infinitive? What is an infinity to go? To, uh, uh, use the word go in English. Give me an infinity of go. Going? Huh? No, that's a, that's a gerund. And it would be it would be a participle in Greek. Go. No, that's past past tense. Go. Future? Huh? Future? No. Roger, what would be the infinitive of go? Yeah. Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> to go. To go. An infinitive is to go. And it means like it's almost like a continuous thing. To go, to go, to go, to go, to go. Okay? Here we have of the truth to come. To come. See, that's infinity. That's second error. Now, what's the difference between first error and second error? Cindy, you remember? First error and second error. Okay, first error is like this. It's extremely sharp punctiliar action. Second heiress is like this. It's a little more topped off, like a mountain, a flat-topped mountain. But it is punctiliar action in both of them. The first heiress is more sharp. 
When you get saved, what kind of action is that? Huh? Absolutely first error, punctuary action. It is instantaneous, brother, brother Mike. Salvation is instantaneous and forever. You get that down there, girl? First errors? Ye are having been saved. Through what? Faith. Where'd you get the faith? All right. How much of that do you do? Volition only. God did give you sovereignty over, over your eternal destiny. But he, if you will hear him, he will give you the ability to believe and to trust. And sometimes you might not completely, totally understand that. Sometimes you won't feel... Any of you ever get to not feel saved some days? <laughs> huh? But we know better, don't we? Then we go back to the foundation. We're saved by grace plus what? For in grace ye are having been saved. Through what? Through faith. And that, and that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's it. We're saved by grace. To come denomina. Denomina. All right, let's look at that one there. Brother Roger, tell me all about this denomina. What English word do we get this from this word right here? Ona, do you know? Dynamite. Have you ever had any dynamite? Never had any dynamite to blow a tree up? Have you ever dynamited a well, brother? Well, no. no you haven't done that yet. Well, you put primer cord or dynamite down in the well and right. shoot it off to break up the found. But if it's all plugged up, you can throw hot dry ice down it. See, I know what I'm talking about. You can do all kinds of stuff. You can acid wash it, whatever you want to do. Dynamite. Dynamite. Dynamina. Now let's look at that word. Uh, Chuck, can you d decline and conjugate that thing for me yet? No. All right, Sharon. Present. Yes, that's right. Present. <laughs> Look to the right. Participle. Participle. And what kind of a mode is it? Or voice, that is. That's passive. passive. What does that tell you? Present, participle, passive. What's going on here? Let's look at it. Always learning and never unto the full knowledge of truth to come being caused to be able. Why are they locked out from the truth? Because they won't believe who Jesus is. And when people won't believe who Jesus is, they've locked themselves away from God. That's the end of it. You're done. Being able. Dynamis. Dynamite. Put down our dynamite. That's where the word dynamite comes from. That's powerful. That's how God created the heavens and the earth, this dynamis here. Now, what? Okay, it's accusative plural neuter. That's what we call declining it. Accusative plural neuter. See, a, a participle is declined and conjugated. Because it's a marriage between a verb and a noun. In English, we don't really have this. We either have verbs or nouns. And right here, this uh, being able, this here would be a gerund. A gerund. So you can learn English and Greek and Hebrew and everything all at once. Dynamis. Not being able. Never always learning. Learning what? False doctrine. I don't try to tell young converts anything but the truth because I don't want to ever come around to me and say, hey, that wasn't quite the truth that you told me ten years ago or five years ago. Now I'm all floundering. If that was not the truth, then whatever. A lot of people say, well, and I take the Bible and I just tear it apart like this. And I say, now this is here, this isn't here, and we go that way. I would rather find them out and still they get five years from now they get and read in a study Bible and then they say, hey, this says it's not in the Bible. I said, that's right. It's what I've been telling you all the time. It's not there from the very first beginning. But does that make the Bible uninspired? You tell them how it got in there. What year it got in there. When did the woman caught in adultery, how, when did that get in the Bible? You remember what year that was? 800 and something A.D. That's a little too far this side of... of Jesus in it. 
But a lot of preachers preach from it. They shouldn't do that, but they do. Because it's not there. Simple as that. That's what we call hermeneutics and scriptural <coughs> criticism. And I don't mean we're taking the Bible and criticizing and pulling apart. What's there is inspired, tense, mold, and voice. And you got some pretty good study Bibles now. I didn't have that when I was going to school. I made my own study Bible. Some of you have seen them. They're a scrambled up mess. You can't hardly read them. They didn't give you... The Bibles today are even broken down in subject. And even they'll tell you every now and then, well, this chapter here shouldn't really be there, this break. It should just go on. You got a lot more material than what I had back then. When I went to, uh, when I took New Testament survey from D.S. Madden, I had to memorize the whole New Testament subjects and verses all the way through the New Testament. That was my final test. There's a whole bunch of them boys didn't make it. I got my A. <laughs> <laughs> but I wrote the whole thing too. I wrote it down by hand and I retyped it and put it in there and then in my Bible. I went there in my Bible and I broke it down all the way through in this right here. See where it says there? See where I broke it down? All the subjects that are there are all broken down. Now your Bibles do that. Back then they didn't. And about in the second month into my New Testament survey class, we were supposed to hand in a whole outline of the New Testament like that. And I typed it up and handed it in there the second month. He said, you did it all already. I said, yeah, well, you told me to do it. So we did it. I went down through there and I broke down every chapter and verse in the Bible and put it down. And I wrote it down by hand there and then I copied it and typed it and you learned things. And what did your teachers used to teach you to do when you were spelling? Write the words. Write the words. Write them. How many times? I did that twice at least. But I had to figure out where it there was no study Bibles back then like this. You had to do it yourself. You learned a lot better. Matter of fact, didn't have any computers either. When I did my associate degree, my bachelor's and my master's and doctorate, guess what I did? Longhand. No computers. You didn't go in there and type it all in there and then go back and make a mistake and print it out and do all this stuff. It correct my spelling and all that stuff. You know, you did it by hand first and then you went back and you typed it. That's different. It's so easy today. <laughs> it's so easy today. <laughs> 3 and verse 8. I'm trying to read this from right to left. What language is that? <laughs> Hebrew. Hone. Tropone. De Iwanes. Kai. Yambereis. Ante Stason, Mose, Hotus, Kai, Hutoi, Ante Stan Tai, Te Alathia, Anthropoi, Karath Thar Minoe, Tonun Adokimoi, Perry, Tain, Pisa. Here we have something. This is very important. All right? Very important. The information comes from this book right here. This is the oldest history book known. This is the book of Jasher. It covers the book of Genesis and Exodus in the Bible. And the book of Jasher is quoted in Joshua 10:13, 2 Samuel 1 and 18, and in 2 Timothy 3 and 8. It's directly quoted in all of these places. Now, the book of Jasher is not an inspired history. It's not an inspired biblical book. But in this book, we have a lot of information that we wouldn't have otherwise. And I've... Uh, played with that a lot as you see it looks like everything else I do scratch it all up mess it up so nobody else wants it <laughs> the book of Jasher 
Now in the book of Jasher, on page 160 in that one, that's right here, page 160, the book of Jasher, it tells all about these bad boys. All about them. And it is in, it is in chapter uh, 77, and it tells it from 77, I think it is, to 79.27. Tells all about these boys. We wouldn't know what their names were if it wasn't for that, and Paul had read the book of Jasher. Matter of fact, the book of Jasher was written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In that area, they had the book of Jasher. What was the most copied book at the Dead Sea Scroll? Who remembers that? Enoch. Who? The book of Enoch. The book of Enoch was the most copied book there. What is the book of Enoch? What kind of a book is it? You remember, Christine? A history book? What? A history book? Uh, the book of Enoch. Oh. What kind of a book is it? It's kind of related to some of the books in the Testament, like the book of Revelation. Uh, Second Thessalonians, what? Eschatology, Eschatology, which means what? Last things, last things. It's a book of last things. And this tells you a lot about things that, that's in the book of Enoch. It's also in this book confirmed by this. Then it says, uh, which, now we have accusative singular relative pronoun there, home. Which, tropon, which way? That's accusative singular also. Which way? And then it, well, actually the sentence starts out with a weak adverse to conjunctive particle. I hope I'm not boring you too much with all this grammar business. I usually don't do a whole lot. But Cindy, you like this, don't you? Yeah. Weak adverse to conjunctive power. Moreover, and, but. And that day actually begins the sentence. And which way? Janus. 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 Now what other name is this like Janus? John, or Juan, yeah. like John, and uh, Jambres. Now these were two brothers. Who was their daddy? Yeah. He's a bad guy. Who? Yeah. Balaam. Yeah. You remember Balaam had a donkey that could talk. You remember that? Yeah. What kind of a guy was Balaam? He was a false prophet. But did he ever speak the truth? There are Balaam's prophecies written in the Bible because they were true prophecies. The devil's the same thing sometimes true, doesn't he? Huh? Did the devil ever preach to Jesus true? He says, jump down off this building. And he said, before you hit the ground, they will catch you. Your angel will catch you and bury you up. Was he quoting the Bible? Yeah. And Jesus quoted the Bible to him too. He said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give to you all the kingdoms of the earth. Did Satan have power over all the kingdoms of the earth at that time? Yes, he did. His men were there. But I'm going to tell you something what God does. God is able to put the right man, even though he's Satan's man, and by his permissive will and his eternal purpose and unpreventable progress, what does he do, Brother Roger? He pushes buttons. Even though they're devil's buttons, he pushes buttons. There's nothing happening in the world today that God is not allowing. Did you know that? I don't care who's going to be elected president, and boy, what a mess we got. I don't care who is elected president, neither what the president we have, it is God's will. His permissive will. It's not his direct will, but it's his permissive will. Is he going to use these people to bring about his eternal purpose? Absolutely. Regardless of what we think. Don't matter. Don't matter who's elected. God's going to get it done. Who's going to protect Israel, Sharon? Who's going to protect Israel if America doesn't? That's right. Michael is the protector of Israel, not us. You think you can do better than Michael? You think America, do you think England could do better than Michael? What a joke. Michael withstood. Go look in the book of Daniel. Read the book of Daniel just a little bit and you can find out what God can do. Does Satan stand against God's people? I think all the time. When you think you got it right, it's leveled out there and everything's okay, watch out. Hellfire and brimstone is coming down. When you think you're at your best and your highest and you're, you're work, sometime at your weakest, and Satan will go boom, just like that. 
elude. Nations rise and fall. But who is pushing the buttons? Babies die, don't they, sometimes? Sometimes they're aborted. Sometimes they're, they just die when they're young, the mortality rate and everything. But I'll guarantee you, every leader made it to where they are, even Donald Trump. I use him as epitome of bad <laughs> for years because <laughs> of what a scoundrel he is. But you know what? God may use him. I don't know. He may tear up that Republican nest up there in Washington, D.C. I don't know. They deserve him. <laughs> Let's put it that way. We don't, but they do. Which way? Janice and Jambres. They stood against Moses. How do you say Moses in Hebrew, Brother Roger? Moshe. Moshe. What does Moshe mean? Do you know what that means, Ann? Moshe? How about that, Sharon? What does Moshe mean? To draw out or to rescue. That's what Moses means, to draw out or rescue. And guess what happened? Who gave him that name? Pharaoh's daughter. How many names did Moses have? You remember? Uh, he had a handful, didn't he? Everybody named Moses something different. The book of Jasher tells you about that. Moses' names. Let's see if I can find it real fast. <coughs> Marion named him. His father named him. His mother named him. His sister named him. His brother named him. Did you know that? All these people named Moses. I didn't find it. Well, I'm looking. Does the book of Jasper read like Chronicles or something? It reads like the Bible, so to speak. Uh, it kind of reads like the, the Bible. Kind of like a history book, right? Well, that's not saying Chronicles. All right, here it is. On, on chapter 68. The book of the Judgment in the Latin Vulgate. The book of Jasper was probably a collection of compilations of ancient Hebrew songs, poems, praisings, and heroes of Israel and their exploits in battle. The book of Jasper is mentioned in Joshua 10, 12, 13, mm -hmm. when the Lord stopped the sun in the middle of the day during the battle yep. of Beth Horn. Mm -hmm. It's the referred to throughout the Bible, even in the New Testament. They, had a, they took a lot of stock in the book of Jasher. It's not inspired. But it'll tell you what, uh, what Noah's wife's name was and how old she was when they got married. Who was the oldest mother in the Bible that we have a record of when she had her first child? Who? No. Moses' mother. She was 150-something years old, I think it was, when she got married, or 120. Let's look back here. And it was at that time the Spirit of God was born Miriam, the daughter of Amram, the sister of Aaron. By the way, who did Amram marry? Huh? Who was who was his his wife? His aunt. Huh? That was his aunt. She was a, over a hundred years older than he was. She went forth and prophesied about the house, saying, "Behold, a son will be born." unto us from my father and mother this time, and he will save Israel from the hands of Egypt. And when Amram heard the words of his daughter, he went out and took his wife back to the house after he had driven her away at the time when Pharaoh ordered every male child of the house of Jacob to be thrown into the waters. He had put her out of the house because he didn't want her to get pregnant and have any more children because he thought he was going to have to kill them. So Amram took Jochebed, his wife, Three years after he had driven her away and came to her and she conceived. Now, it tells you all about how old they were and everything else. And then later on, it talks about all of, of his names. Shabar, uh, let's see, Jared. His sister Miriam called him Jared, which means what? Jared. Descending, and Aaron called and Aaron called him Abu, Abu Zanuk, and his father Amram called him Abigdor, 
And then uh, the nurse called him Abi Soka. And uh, all Israel called his name Shemaiah, son of Nathanael. So you go down there and you see all of these names of Moses. He had more than one name. Pharaoh's daughter called him Moshe because she drew him out, rescued him out of the river, the Nile River. His family believed for several months. They believed and they tried to hide this child, but in the end, what did they do? They put him in a river and let him go. They exposed him. All of the Hebrews were supposed to expose their children in the river. And what was in that river over there, Brother uh, Crocodile. Crocodile? And they ate them little babies up right and left, just gobble, 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 like candy. But Moses, they put him in a little basket, and the other ones put him in baskets. They put their babies in baskets, too. But God guided Moses' basket. Crocodiles, that was one of their gods, too, wasn't it? Yeah, they? all this. They had, gods, they had gobs of gods. Gobs of gods. Well, Janus and Jambres, the sons of Balaam, stood against Moses. We know who they are now, don't we? These are the guys that did it. When Janus and Jambres came in there, did they turn the, the did they turn the water into blood? Yeah, well, yeah, they did. They, they, they did that. They they were imitating Moses. What else did they do? When Aaron threw down Moses's rod, which was Adam's rod, which had came down to all the families which God had given to Adam, according to the book of Jasher. When he threw that rod down, what did it become? You remember what it became, Ona? A dragon. A dragon. What is that Hebrew word, Brother Roger? Tanin. Tanin. What does it mean? Uh, a fire-breathing fire dragon. Now his rod became a dragon. Okay? And when Janus and Jabri threw their rods down, what did they become? Dragons. So we got three dragons in the floor of Pharaoh's palace. And how big are these characters? Pretty good size. Pretty good size dragon, big dragons. Like dinosaurs or something. You know, these are monsters. What is a Leviathan, by the way? This dragon like creature. What is a Leviathan? Huh? What? This, uh, and what kind of a creature is a Leviathan? What kind of creature is it? Cindy, you remember? Sharon? It's a supernatural creature. Most of these people, when they, when they had a storm on the Sea of Galilee or something, they thought that that was a Leviathan guarding the gates of hell because they believed the rabbis thought the gates of hell were in the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. You know, it's about 600 feet deep. And when all the storms come out there, they thought it. When, when Jonah went out into the boat and got caught in the storm out there, guess what? They thought it was a Leviathan stirring up the water. So they started praying to God to overtake the Leviathan, which is a supernatural creature, which they usually looked at as a servant of their gods. Or we find out that the Lord's got a Leviathan or two up his sleeve, doesn't he? One of those Leviathans was down there in Egypt, right here in Pharaoh's palace. A Leviathan is a supernatural, large supernatural, uh, they call them sea serpents, giant creatures. The Leviathan was the creature of the waters. What was the creature of the desert? The behemoth. The behemoth. Those are two supernatural creatures. Some of the people trying to grab at straws, try to make these creatures in the Bible dinosaurs. But they're not dinosaurs. These are supernatural creatures. Supernatural creatures. What does it mean? This creature that was in Pharaoh's palace, they throw it, they throw the rod down, and it becomes God's rod becomes a leviathan. Not a, now, did Moses ever throw that rod down? And it become a nahash, a nahash. What's a nahash, brother? A serpent, snake. But when he threw it down, I think Moses and Aaron got really excited. God's teaching them a lesson, and He's teaching Israel a lesson at the same time. They throw the rod down, and whoa, a leviathan. A giant, sir, uh, a giant dragon. I just imagine. Can you imagine being there in that place, Brother Roger, when all this is taking place? Watching that dragon roar and breathe fire. That's what Tani means. You look it up. Back in your uh, uh, Greek Hebrew study Bible, look that up. Tani, if you can read Hebrew at all. Tani, you look up Tani, and you find out what it is. 
That is a fire-breathing dragon. Well, they threw it down, and they got a surprise. And then Janice and Jambri threw her down, and what kind of surprise do you think they got? They got the same thing. But we have God's Leviathan, and we have Satan's Leviathan. And God, you know how many angels are there? Millions, billions, how many? Forty million? How many angels are there? How many angels did Satan, how many angels and, de and spirits did he deceive to go with him? One third. Thank you, Only. You got an A plus. Okay, now let's start some division here. We got a mathematician right back here. We got, we got three dragons on the floor. Now there's two angels and spirits against every one of Satan's. Now God's given Satan a little edge right here. Guess what? He gives Satan, he can throw out two of his leviathans to God's one. So here we have one third of God's and two thirds. Two against one. Now in the angelic forces today, those angels that, that went away from God, there's only one third of them. And one third of the spirit powers. But what? Here in Pharaoh's palace, God gives Satan the edge. He's teaching us a lesson today. When God's outnumbered, he's not outnumbered. When we're outnumbered, we're not outnumbered. This didn't happen. What happened? God's Leviathan was his supernatural also. What did he do on it? He ate the other two Leviathans. God is more powerful even when two against when he gives Satan the edge, he's still more powerful. All the how many nations in the world? How many how many does Satan have? All of them, except what? What's God's only nation? Israel. God has one nation. Not America. It's not Russia. It's not China. It's not Japan or any of these places. It is Israel. And who is the one protecting Israel? Who's the angel? Michael. He's a guardian angel. The archangel Michael is a guardian angel over Israel. All the rest of them? All these nations? Did God allow the leaders to be in these nations that are there? This is what we call God's universal kingdom. Here's God's universal kingdom like this. Here is eternity. And here is this little space of time right there. And God allows, by his permissive will, everything to take place in this period of time. Okay? But God is really... Satan is in control here, but God's control all. He only allows the ones, Satan men, that he wants up there. Was uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, was he Satan's man? Antiochus Epiphanes? What's First and, sec first and Second Maccabees about? In the, in the, in the uh, Apocrypha. Uh, Cindy? What's it about, Brother Roger? When uh, the, it's, was it the Ptolemies went in and desecrated the temple? Yes. Antiochus Epiphanes went in there and desecrated the temple and killed thousands of Jews and sacrifice swine on the, on the altar of God. And those Maccabees, what does Maccabees mean, by the way? Hammer. hammer. Maccabees mean hammer. When those boys went there, they finally wrested it out of his hands and put him down. And, of course, they had the revolt, the Maccabean revolt, that you read of in First and Second Maccabees. By the way, First and Second Maccabees, that's in the, in the Apocrypha, the uh, book of Jasher is not in the Apocrypha. The book of Enoch is not in the Apocrypha. There's a lot of books in the Apocrypha. I would tell you to read them. It's not all inspired, but there are information. First and Second Maccabees is a history book. And it's an inspired history book. From First and Second Maccabees and Second Maccabees, the second chapter, what are you going to find there, Christine? I don't remember. How about it? You remember, young lady? Chuck, you know what's in Second Maccabees, the second chapter? Cindy, you know what's there? How about it, Roger? Feast of Lights. What? The Feast of Lights. In these days, God wore Jeremiah the prophet to take the ark and the covenant and the tabernacle and go to the world of the mountain, which is Mount Nebo over there, where Moses saw the promised land and hide that in a cave, and they would not have this ark and the covenant. See, the ark and the covenant didn't go to Babylon. 
The Ark of the Covenant did not go to, to Europe. It didn't go to Rome. Their facsimiles did, but the real Ark of the Covenant is down in that mountain someplace. And it said that God would hide that and nobody would find that Ark of the Covenant. And what about all these legends they got? I think the book of Second Maccabees, the second chapter, supersedes them all. Because that's a history book that tells you what happened. Jeremiah the prophet took it and hid that in a cave. And on that same mountain, what else happened? What historic thing according to the book of Jude? What happened on that mountain, and historically that mountain, where Moses looked in the promised land? Brother, uh... I would say crucifixion is not right. Huh? What, what happened up there, uh, Christine? On the mountain where, where God showed Moses the promised land. What else happened to Moses on that mountain? You remember, Chuck? Is that where he died? That's where he died. Who buried Moses? God. God buried Moses. Who wanted his body? Satan. Satan. All right. Satan wanted his body and he wrestled. And guess what happened? Who come to the rescue? Michael. 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 He said, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. And he didn't get the body of Moses, did he? What would Israel have done with that body of Moses if they had it? They'd have been kissing his bones and worshiping him to the day, just like Catholicism. Where did Catholicism get all their rites and incense and all that kind of stuff? Right out of Judaism. Moses. And then it was said, Hos, Hotu, Hutos. This is a little adverb. Page 296, Analytical Greek Lexicon, if you want to write that down. In this same manner, who told in this same manner also, here we have a cumulative particle that chi is. is not a, it is a, not an and or conjunction there. Cumulative. Also, these ones, they oppose for themselves. Look at that. On this tonante. Third person plural. Present, indicative. What voice is that, Brother Roger? Middle. What does that re represent? Sharon, do you know what the middle voice does? Volition. Volatative quality of mankind. They wanted to stand against God. They wanted to fight God. It was their purpose to fight God. Who was inspiring them? Satan. Satan. These are Satan's men, all right. To oppose in the truth, men. Katef, katef, thar, minoi. And this is nominally plural masculine present participle passive. Having been corrupted, kata and thero, kataf thero, having been poisoned, <coughs> corrupted, destroyed, spoiled, depraved, all of this, having been depraved, what do you know? Having become what? Reprobate. What's reprobate? What's reprobate mean? Damned. Huh? Damned. That's damned. What does reprobate really mean? It means to actively deny the truth. Did they have powers of Satan? Were, when they threw their rods down and God's Leviathan ate their Leviathans, do you think that would have convinced the average person? But did it convince Pharaoh? No. Why? Because their hearts were hardened and they were corrupt. Their hearts were corrupt. So what is reprobate? Mean again? Reprobate, one who actively denies the truth. Having been corrupted, tone new on. Tone new on. There's a lot of words for mind in Greek, isn't there? A lot of words for mind in Greek. There's noose, which we have here. There's nome, there's boule, there's frame, there's sophia, there's thelematos. Let's look at it. Noose. The faculty of the faculties of perception and understanding, feeling, judging, determining spiritually. Ephesians four and seven teen. Philippians 4 and 7, Colossians 2, 18, 1 Timothy 6 and 5, 2 Timothy what? 3 and 8. Romans 7, 23 through 25. A new faculty of understanding is inherent with a new birth. God changes your across mind. 
doesn't he? A cross mind. He changes your mind. And how about the word no may? No may. Let's write that down someplace. No may. There's another word right there. No may. No may. It comes to the word knowledge. No means to the ability to discern the capacity of judgment as far as conduct is determined. No may. 1 Corinthians 1 and 10. In no may, the direction to a certain object determines the thought. But in news, the opinion of the whole determines the thought. Now, I know that's really hard to understand a little bit. And the way of thinking and judgment is a emphasized in a lost person, isn't it? How does a lost person think? Carnal. Carnal. Okay, now how about the word boule? Boule. The mental will or plan or counsel. This means to will or wish, boule. Thelematos is another word. And by the way, boule is in Acts uh, 27, 39, 2 Corinthians 1, 17, Matthew 1, 19, Acts 15, 37, and 18, 27, and Hebrews 6, 17, and Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. And also there is the word thelematos. Thelematos. Remember what that word thelematos means, Cindy? Remember that? There is in Ephesians, the first chapter. Thelematos means the spiritual activating force. Spiritual activating force. What is God's spiritual activating force? The Holy Spirit through his Bible, through the Word of God that we have. What is Satan's spiritual activating force? False religion. Satan's act Huh? The carnal mind. Does it coexist? All right. Frame. 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 I didn't write boule down there. There's boule. That's boule. And here's, oh, I got no may up there. Boule. And then we got Thelemato. Thelematos. And now we have frame. Frame. The diaphragm, midriff, the mind, the intellect, horse sense, common sense. You know anybody who's really smart don't have a bit of common sense? Einstein. Remember Einstein? Couldn't tie his shoes. <laughs> Frame. Horse sense. I used to say about Brother Madden, I said, Brother Madden, you got more horse sense than a whole herd of wild mustangs. Because he did. There's another fellow. Many, many fellows. Ray. Ray's got a lot of horse sense. Ray Hernandez. That boy's got a absurd dose of horse sense. Right there. Frame. And then we have the beautiful word Sophia. 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 You getting all this stuff down? Sophia. Remember what Sophia means, Cindy? How about it, Sharon? Is it wisdom? It is godly wisdom. This is the highest form of godly wisdom is that's Sophia. This is the wisdom of God. Sophia. Sophia Lauren? See, she got a good name. Godly wisdom. Let's go back now. Let's look at some more. Did you like that little little episode? Having been corrupted in the mind of them. What kind of a mind it is? Their way of looking at things. Their way of looking at an object. Reprobate. Adikamoi. That means what? Un, what we call not qualified. Not tested. They, broke, they, broke, they, 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 they did not pass the test. Concerning the faith. Now we have these magicians who oppose Moses and the truth. We have Simon Magnus in Acts 18, or Acts 8, 19 through 24. We have Bar Jesus or Elamus in Acts 13, 4 through 12. We have Jezebel in 2 Kings 9, 22. In 1 Timothy 5.13, we have busybodies fooling around with uh, Ouija boards and magic. We have uh, the witch of Endor in 1 Samuel 28 and verse 3. And then we have Balaam right there in Pharaoh's palace with them two boys. 
And then in Numbers 22 and 5, Balaam gave true prophecy sometimes, but that man was a rat. I one time did a sermon on the true prophecies of Balaam that came about and are still yet to come about. All right, we're up here at 7 o'clock. You want one more verse or you want to turn loose on the world? Yes. One more. Okay. Allah, who prokops usen, epi pleon, hagar, anoia, auton, ek delos, este, posen, hos, kai, he, ekinun, eganito. But, and what kind of a, what kind of a, a conjunction is this? A strong adversative conjunction. Page 15, if you want to write that down. And then we have an adverb of negation here. And not, they shall blaze a trail. Not, they shall blaze a trail. Third person plural, future indicative active. They shall blaze a trail. Third person plural. And this word prokopto, what does that mean? Prokopto. Remember what that one means, Cindy? 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, it tells us that our beatings were not in vain. In... Uh, here it says, these are the trailblazers, but not they shall blaze a trail upon more for the folly. Look at that word folly there. Anoia. What is anoia? What's anoia? Brother Roger, what do you think anoia is? It's not anoia. <laughs> I'm not annoying you, am I? What's anoia mean? Brainless. Not able to think of them. Ek delos, plain, evident, manifest. It shall be to each one, third person singular, future, indidal, mid, future indicative middle voice, to all men, as also the those it became. Sharon, do you have that in the Amplified Bible here? You want to come up and read that last, the last uh, three, eight, three, uh, seven, eight, and nine for me. Three, seven, eight, nine. I used to have people read for me because I could not see to read. If I had to, I couldn't see to read that either. <coughs> Too small for okay, me. Okay, seven. These weak women will listen to anybody who will teach them. They are forever inquiring and getting information, but are never able to arrive at a recognition and knowledge of the truth. Now, just as Janus and Jambres were hostile and resisted Moses, so these men are also hostile to and oppose the truth. They have depraved and distorted minds and are reprobate and counterfeit and to be rejected as far as faith is concerned. Do nine? Nine, yeah. Oh, yeah. But they will not get very far, for their rash folly will be, uh, become obvious to everyone, as was that of their... Magicians. Magicians mentioned. Ask Janice Magicians and Jamboree. Yeah. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Any questions? Interrogato. Interrogatio. Erotao in Greek. Any questions? Any at all? Brother Mike, you got a question? Did you learn something tonight? Well, we went from three, uh, three, seven through nine. I hope God's Word I hope you learned something from it. I wanted to look at some of these words for mind so you'd understand a little better just when something says that Greek is a giant language. It is grammatically absolutely perfect and not only that, it has a lot of vocabulary. The Hebrew language in many places is very weak on vocabulary, but it has what? What's the, what's the absolute asset to Hebrew, Brother Roger? What's the asset of Hebrew? Action. action. In Greek is perfection. In Hebrew is action. All right. Any questions? What do you mean when you say action? Give me an example. Barashith bara Elohim et Hashemayim with our hearts. In beginnings, he had created that powerful ability to create and polish and perfect the heavens and the earth. Okay? 
He had created the heavens and the earth. And then the earth she had become formless and void, and you see this action. All the translations is going to just, just skip over this, and you're going to... I mean, it's not there. But in the Hebrew, that action is there. That power is there. The power of the reconstruction of the earth is there. It says, And Spirit God, we ruah Elohim, Merichesheth, El Panei Tahom. It tells us that Spirit God suffered over, the action of God suffering over the destruction of the earth. He suffered over it, and he mourned over it, and he reconstructed it. It says that too, Brother Roger. We looked at that in Hebrew. All right. Anything else? Go out and do something eternal. And would you mind this, this, this in the prayer? Can you do that? All right.